Let us begin this morning from the book of Matthew chapter 19. This is uh, the same account that we read in Mark a few weeks ago where I was sharing about the lost disciple. But let us continue to just draw more revelation from this account of this young man, this young rich ruler. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16, the Bible says, Behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? Let me skip a few verses and go to verse 21. He says, Jesus said to him, If you will be perfect, go and sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great, great possessions. The question posed to you and I this morning is what can you not offload? What are you not willing to offload that may cost you eternal life? The young man came to Jesus and said, Teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? And he says to Jesus all the things that he has already done. And Jesus applauds these things. He says, well done. You've, that's great. But what you must do is to go and offload. But this young man in this particular moment, it was too difficult for him to offload. He couldn't offload. He, the attachment that he had to the things that he had was greater than eternal life. Isn't that sad? That material things and the things that we have here that we carry can be placed in competition with eternal life. May God help us. Let me call my son Levi to come forward. and I just want to share with you something this week. I don't know if I can have another microphone. Come, come, come Levi. I asked for his permission to share this. It's, it's, it's a testimony. Levi, for many, many weeks, probably months, has been asking to play a certain game. And he said to me and his mom, everyone, all my friends are on this game. It is, I, I really want it. And I haven't said this to you, but to be honest, I just didn't get time to research. But also, I just wanted him to wait. You know, sometimes it's good for, this, for us to learn to wait. It's not that I must run and start doing. I said, wait. So he goes around and goes to his mom. And he says all these things to his mom, all the things that he would do, all his chores and everything. And then I'm told this week that a, an agreement has been made that if he does something, then he will get to play on, what is it, Roblox. And... I said, well, because it's been said, then it is time. But all this time through my delay, the Spirit of the Lord was just saying to me, I'm not comfortable. I'm not comfortable with this. And, but I, I, I didn't look into it. So yes, uh, when, when, we, when we sat down, we opened an account. And we've done some research and we looked at the basic things and yeah, you know, everyone is on this game, it's fine. And so we did some research and we opened the thing, we opened the account and he was ready to go. He set up his username and password. But then in the last moment I said, let us look into this. And why, why don't you share? What, what, you know, why I got Levi to come is because what then happened was very difficult for him. It was really difficult for him. I saw how excited he's been. And 
we even opened an account and he was saying all my friends play this game and I don't want to be one of those fathers that stop my, my children from being like other children. You know, I, I don't want to be one of those fathers that re refuse for the sake of refusing. <laughs> I know some of you may relate, who may have had fathers or who are those fathers who say my children must struggle because I struggled. I didn't have lifts to school, so walk. When you have five vehicles parked in the car, in, 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 in your driveway. We don't, you know, I did, I struggled for money, so you have to struggle as well. Everything we do must have a purpose. It is not for the sake of. And so I don't want him to be isolated. I will let you share. I will let you share. It's your story. So... I was really excited about getting Roblox because all of my friends were there. I was excited to play with my friends until we went into further research of this and found out that it's actually not what it looks like. And, and how, you know, it's, we, 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 we researched and, and what I saw because he said, oh, let's go into this it's the imagery for me that shocked me first. There is a lot of demonic imagery. We saw it, didn't we? Yeah. A lot of demonic imagery, a lot of occultic imagery. And you may need to study or, 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 or find out someone who knows these things for you to understand the significance of some of these things and what they do to your mind, not only children. There is a lot of signage that is hidden in this game. I don't even understand how the game works. I understand that it's a platform and others make games in there, others play games and they hang out. Not only was there worries that I have seen and, and, and speaking to a couple of young people who are going to share with us in, in, the, in the seminar that we're going to have with parents about some pornography that has found its way in there some hackers and adults who have found themselves in there talking to young children. Besides that, just the imagery. And it was delicate because Levi had looked forward to this for so long. And I saw what the Lord had been speaking to me about to share today about this narrow gate. And I shared with him this. And I say to him that Levi, the road to eternal life is difficult. The gate is narrow. Not everything that everyone does is for the children of God to do. And I'm glad because I didn't just say no. I showed him and he saw it. And you know, you went through a, a little moment where you were a little bit sad, weren't you? Yeah. A little bit disappointed. But I praise God that as I communicated with him, he came around and he said, actually, no, this is not for me. And he processed the fact that, yes, he wanted to be with other children, but eternal life for him is more important. Hallelujah. And it reminded me of the, of, yes, praise God. It reminded me of the young rich ruler. Because Levi came to me and said, Dad, I have done this, I've done that, I've done this, I've done that. I have done my chores, I've done the things you've asked me, now allow me to hold on and, and be part of this thing. And for him, as a young boy, it was difficult for him to come to terms of the fact that he may not be part of this community on Roblox. And he said, I choose and I'm willing. And I promise you, I did not force him. It is a journey that he took and made a decision himself. He jumped on and began to make a, what did you, a comment. Yeah. Yes, a review. And he wrote a review and said, I advise all Christian children to get off this platform. You know, and I thank God for him. Now, I want to give you an illustration of something put the put
put this down. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7 that enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. The NLT says you can enter God's kingdom only through the narrow gate. There is no other way for you to use, only through the narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few find it. This is an illustration of the narrow gate. I hope I don't make it fall. And the word of God is saying to us that only through this are we going to have eternal life. This rich young ruler, hold it with your hands, had done everything but he had something that he was holding on to. And Christ said to him, that you must offload some of these things in order for you to gain eternal life. For Levi, and I, I want you to understand me well, this is not prescriptive. This is about him. It is about me, it is about my family. We all have responsibilities for ourselves and our children. But for this, for what I saw, it was something that I saw was a danger because the people that are on this platform and, you know, I was looking at the statistics. 214 million users. In May 2023, everyone, all the children are on this thing. But Levi, I told him, is not all the children. And the Bible says that few, few will find it. And so he wanted to try and go into eternal life. But the Lord in his wisdom showed me that we must shed something. Hallelujah. And it was so difficult because this in here, some of his identity, some of his identity was wrapped up in this. Some of his potential social life was wrapped up in this. But one thing that I was saying to my son is my son what is ahead, eternal life, is so much more precious. I have had to be in situations where I have missed on, I've missed out on being part of a group, being part of something because I had to consider eternal life. And I know that is your story. You are sat here because of the same reason. There are places when I gave my life to Christ as much as I enjoyed being in those places, as much as I enjoyed participating in certain things, you know, I, I, I was a fun guy, you know. I know some of you don't think that. I'm, I'm a fun guy. I love fun. I love enjoyment. There's some banter which I enjoyed, but the Holy Spirit, when he came and dwelt in my life and when I became a new creation, he began to tell me that you can't involve yourself in this conversation. You can't interact with females in this way. You can't do and go to this place. Why? Because your eternity is at stake. It is not about restriction. It is not about living a life where we say, these Christians, they are so boring. It is not about boring. If we look at the life of Jesus, Jesus was a man full of life. It is just that his life and the life that he, he lived was incompatible with what others had seen, the religious ones. And so it's not about restriction. The Bible says we are free. But let not our freedom, the scripture says, be your excuse for sin. Let not your freedom, because you're free, be your excuse to sin. There are some people who say, Pastor, I am free. 
I am not religious. And I can do whatever I want to do because by the grace of God, he has welcomed me. And indeed, as I began saying, he has welcomed you. But he said to this young rich ruler who also was living a righteous life, he had kept the laws of Moses. And he said, Master, I've done this. And let me tell you something. Having wealth is not a sin. Being wealthy and powerful and being influential is not a sin. But for this young rich ruler, Jesus looked at him and said that your wealth is the thing that will cause you not to enter the kingdom of heaven. It is your wealth. So discard it or flood it. And so Levi yesterday, it was so difficult for him, but by the grace of God, he offloaded this particular part of his life. And he is able to go and find eternal life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Levi. Thank you. What is the baggage? I'll keep this close to me. What is your baggage? That may stop you from entering the kingdom of heaven. For some of us, we are walking around with culture. There are some cultural things that we are carrying around with us. And these cultural things have come to present themselves as part and parcel of your life. For some, on top of culture, they are walking around with the wrong doctrine. Do you know how difficult it is for some people to come into the understanding of the right doctrine because of the doctrine that they have been fed? You know, Paul was speaking, I believe, to the Galatians and he was talking about circumcision. And you know what he said? He says, don't let anybody tell you to go and mutilate yourself. And what he was addressing with the Jews at the time is that it is not important to continue with something where the new has already been revealed. And he was saying to them that the circumcision that matters now is that of the heart. But there are some Jews who are holding on to the circumcision that they have been told in the Torah in the law and that for them was what they needed to enter the kingdom of heaven Jesus came and he said this is me I have come to give you life I have come to circumcise your hearts and there are some, 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 some Gentiles some Romans, some Greeks people from all over the place some Egyptians who are coming into a place of knowledge and understanding of the scriptures and the gospel and they became born again and the Jews say now you must be circumcised and Paul was saying to them no you mustn't you don't have to do that because circumcision was just a shadow of what has already happened in your life but imagine there are some Jews who held on to circumcision onto wrong doctrine, onto their culture. And they say, now, this is what is going to get us into heaven. Those are the same Pharisees that saw Jesus healing on the Sabbath and became angry in their hearts. They were saying, how dare? How can he be doing the things that we have been warned against doing in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, without realizing that the New Covenant is here? Do you know the danger of holding on to wrong doctrine? The danger of holding on to some funny cultural practices? There are people who believe that if certain things land on their roof, certain birds land on their roof, then death has come upon their house. As a child of God, that is absolute nonsense. 
There are people who believe that before they go on a journey, they must do certain things and those things are not prayer. There are people who believe that before they are married, there are certain rights that they must do. When you have a child, you must wash them in certain things. It is absolute nonsense. And these are the things that may cause you to lose the kingdom of heaven and eternal life. You have been called to freedom. It is for freedom that he has set you free. And the problem with holding on to some of this baggage is when it is time to go and to walk that path, you can't go in. You just cannot go in. This is why we have lukewarm, lukewarm Christians walking the Christian life through this wide gate. The Bible is saying that the, 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 the path to destruction, it is wide. Guess what? You can go in with all your baggage. With all your baggage, you are able to go through that one. You can still label yourself a Christian. You can still think that you are doing right, but you can go through that one with all your baggage. For some of us, our baggage is dreams. We are holding on to our dreams and that is added baggage. Dreams that have not come from God. This is something that you have said, I've always wanted to do and be. This young rich ruler, he probably had a dream to be rich. And guess what? He achieved his dream. There are some people whose dream has been to do something and by the time you begin to know what the purpose of God is for your life, you realize that there is an incompatibility that is creeping in. I don't know how many of you have realized that. You are saying that this walk of faith, how come it is beginning to be incompatible with my dreams? And this is why we are living in a world where the gospel must be preached according to what we want to hear. That is how we grow a church. It is the pressure that I must feel as a pastor in this church. Yes, we are seeing numerical growth, but if we want more growth, I need to tone down the message. Because I may say something that will offend you. Maybe I already said something this morning that has offended you. We must tone it down a little bit because we must allow, this is the doctrine of the Antichrist, we must allow God to find a way to fit in within our program, allow him to fit in within your dreams. Because this is what I have desired for myself. Do you know that God looks at you and says, my son, my daughter, only if you knew <laughs> that if you were to walk in my dream for you, in my thoughts for you, it is much better outcome for you. Hallelujah. And so some people are carrying their dreams around like baggage. And because of that, they are looking at this narrow gate and it's not that they don't want to go in, it's just that it's incompatible. They can't go in. They have tried. They've tried always and then there's another gospel that is offered for them. Come and be a Christian that goes through here. Look, we can all be here. Bring all your friends. Bring all your friends. Live how you want. Live how you want. These, these radical preachers, they are saying to you that you, 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 you must not fornicate. Here's fornication. Fornication is like, ah, uh ah. -uh, we can't, but guess what? In here, everyone is welcome. Let's fornicate. Let's fornicate. We are all going to the same place. And so we find that we are living in a world where Christians are walking the wide path because they have failed to get rid of their baggage. Hallelujah. Is success the baggage that you're carrying around? I want you to notice that most of the things I'm mentioning here are not prescribed as sin. We must grow to the point where we go beyond what we know as sin. Thou shalt not murder, we know that. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. There is nowhere that says thou shalt not pray in the morning. There is nowhere that says thou shalt reduce what you are watching at night so that you can wake up in the morning. And guess what? That can be sin for you, it can be your baggage. 
your love of watching uh, films and Netflix at night and you are unable to wake up in the morning, that could be your baggage. There is nothing wrong with doing whatever you are doing, but the problem is that you are missing out on the key things that will give you power to succeed. Jesus did not force his disciples to wake up early with him and pray, but he did it because that was the discipleship so that they can watch and see. You see, the prescription there was, I want you to be like me. Look at all the details and follow them. Hallelujah. So is it your success? Is it a relationship in your life that is a something that you are holding on and saying, I cannot offload. This relationship is too beneficial for me. This relationship is something that if I give up, what happens? There are people who are staying in relationship, even plutonic ones, but relationship because these relationships look like they will give them a benefit in the future. When you are on the come up, you will find that there are people who will always be around you. And some of the people who are around the people that are on the come up, they are believers and God is saying to them, that relationship is baggage, get rid of it. But many believers are saying, but if I stop hanging around with this person, if I stop fellowshipping with this person and he is going somewhere and he's going where I need to go, then what's going to happen? What will happen with me? And I know God is saying to someone here that it is your success is not attached to someone. Perhaps your brother is a multimillionaire and you know that that relationship is toxic in your life. You are tolerating such toxicity in your life. This person is speaking curses and negativity in your life. It is affecting your mental health, but you are holding on for dear life. Because you think that he's going to give you a deposit for your house. Because you're thinking that he's going to give you a step up into the business world. But God may be saying to you, like the rich young ruler, you must offload some of the things. Hallelujah. I want you to be confident in your God. Can you be confident and know that if God wants to take you from point A to B, he will take you there? You do not need any external help. If he sends people, he will send them. But you must not hold on to some things and people because you are trying to make it. Hallelujah. Could fear of the unknown be one of your luggage? Could fear of failure be the thing that God is asking you to offload? The fear of failure could it be hurt and disappointment? You are so hurt and disappointed that you are carrying it around like a bag on your head. And God is saying to you that only if you could release that hurt, if you could start the process of offloading some of the pain that you have gone through, you will be able to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because what this pain does and what some of this heart that we are holding on to, it becomes a tool and a point of contact for the enemy's work in your life. You may have got everything right in your life, but because you are holding on to a certain pain and disappointment, and it's become therapeutic for you to hold on to this. The enemy will use that to grow so many other things in your life that will become a barrier for you entering the kingdom of heaven. Is your luggage people's expectation? Is your luggage the need to please people? I was speaking somewhere and I asked a question. I said, who here struggles with the need to please people? 
And a few honest people put their hands up. And I say that in this room, may God give us the courage to be honest. Because I don't believe that there is anyone who doesn't struggle with the need to please. It is a matter of degree, some greater than others. But we all have intrinsically inside of us need to please people. And this is a dangerous thing that God wants us to offload. And he wants you to replace it with the need to please God. If you can say that I don't care about pleasing people, I will please God. Because the need to please people will be the thing that will cause you to compromise. I've been there. When you are in a group of friends, you are in a group of people, and everyone is doing something, and you, you look like if you, if, if you say you can't, or if you become an opposition to this, you are a party pooper, you are the sort of person that people don't like to be around. And so in the need to please people, you find yourself in a situation that is dangerous for your life. Is it anger? Is it lust? All these things, they need to be laid down and to be stripped aside. My prayer for you, and as we go into the week of fasting and prayer, we want to focus and pivot on stripping. And we want to say, Lord, I am getting rid of every need to please people. Some of my dreams, oh God, I am getting rid of them. And I am open to your dreams. You say that you have great thoughts that you think about me. Lord, if they're incompatible with any dream that I harbor, then I get rid of it. Hallelujah. We say that, Lord, I am getting rid of certain relationships in my life. And as you're becoming unburdened, you keep going back to God and, and you look and you find that there is still something. There is still something and you come back to God in prayer. And that's what we are doing as we fast. We are saying, Lord, strip us of everything that is holding us back from experiencing a life of victory in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know it is not an exciting prayer because stripping and pruning is a difficult process. It is a painful process. I'm not going to lie to you, my brothers and sisters. I need a lot of stripping. And every time God comes out with stripping or with his cutters for, 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 for me being uh, trimmed and, and pruned, uh, it's, it's difficult. It's painful. It challenges what you are used to. When doctrine is challenged and you realize that you believe something that is wrong, it is your belief system that you've grown up with since you're a child. And now you are realizing all this time I've been believing something that is not reflecting of what God is really saying. It is painful to strip those things away. But God is saying that I want to strip away your religion. I want to strip away your religion. I want to strip away some of the things that you have done all along. There are some behaviors and some things that you do and because you've done them all your life, you think that is right. But God is challenging you and saying that I want to strip you away. Hallelujah. And once we are getting rid of all this baggage, the Bible is saying that through this narrow gate, we are able to walk. Hallelujah. We are able to walk and we are able to walk in freedom because we are stripping away all the things that are holding us back. I want to read for you a, a, a scripture that you are familiar with. Samuel chapter 1, 1 Samuel chapter 17. Verse 32 to 40. Don't worry about this Philistine. David said to Saul, I'll go and fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul said. There is no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You are only a boy and he's been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted, I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. When a lion and a bear came to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it 
with a club and I rescue the lamb from its mouth. The animal turns on me. I catch it by the jaw and club it to this, to its death. He said, I have done this to both lions and bears and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine. For he has defied the armies of the living. This boy, David, he was there just a simple little boy. And Saul told him, nonsense, you cannot do this. Look at us. We are men of war. And this guy is a man of war. And he continues. Then Saul, in verse 38, he says, Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet, and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped on the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. This is how so many of us do in our walk of faith. We appease ourselves that we are in faith. We use the right language. You see, David was there, and God has called him and given him every tool that he needs, and now he began to put on the armor that did not belong to him. He began to put on all these things that did not belong. When God was showing him how to fight the bears and the lions, he did not have armor on. Do you see the spirit of religion? Now when he has come and he's about to step into his calling, now the spirit of religion came upon him. In the name of so, the spirit of religion is one that has lost the battle. The religious spirit is one that has not conquered. And what religious people do, because they have failed, they want you to fail. Because they've never seen victory, they want you to see loss like they have. So, the spirit of religion came upon David. The spirit of religion did not recognize the testimony that David had just given before the king. The spirit of religion is one that will say to you that you must do certain things to succeed. You have so many testimonies in your life of when you just believed God and God did it for you. And now the spirit of religion is saying that you must be corrupt a little bit. Everyone is doing it. You know, doing business in Africa, I, I got to a point where it was almost impossible to bring in things into one of the ports. And I had believers, people who are born again, saying to me, my friend, we are all doing it. You, you, you can't get things done without paying people off. I had a brother saying to me that, you see, you are restricting yourself by not being corrupt because the money that you could make is what is needed for the kingdom. You can save yourself tax money. Do you know when you're faced with a situation where you can pay a thousand dollars and get things through, through corruption, or face a bill of $20,000. And someone, the spirit of religion can say to you that the 19 that you save, it can go and buy furniture in Fountain Church. The money that you are saving, the corrupt, the corruption, it is, that's what, is, that's what the spirit of religion says to you. It says to you that there are certain things you need to do to please God. And so the religious spirit spoke to David and said, put on these things. And he put it on and he realized he was not free. Then David says, I can't go in these. He protested to Saul. I'm not used to them. Hallelujah. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones of stream from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Hallelujah. God is saying to you, get rid of all the things that are saying to you that you need them to succeed in life. Get rid of all the things that have embedded themselves in your life. Get rid of certain things that you become accustomed to. If it means cutting off some things that have become part of your program, cut them off. Hallelujah. The wide gate, many go through it. And they are all allowed to go through it with all the baggage that they picked up along the way. With all the baggage and the luggage they picked up, they can go through the wide gate. But God is saying it is time for stripping. Three things. Number one, you must choose to deny yourself. It is a choice. 
And to choose God means to deny yourself. Are you prepared to deny yourself of what everybody seems to be doing? Teenagers, young people, are you willing to deny yourself of what everyone is doing? There are certain shows that we spoke about. I, I, I didn't go again this because I believe that you already, because I don't want to be prescriptive on what you watch and give you a list of what to watch or not. But are you willing to go to school and people are talking about what happened in the last night's episode and you are happy to, to have no clue? Are you willing to be ridiculed? To deny yourself of the opportunity to be popular? When everybody starts having boyfriends and girlfriends, are you willing to be the weird or to be the odd one out? Are you willing to deny yourself of the pleasures of the world for the sake of the kingdom? The Bible tells us of a rich man who went to hell and he he saw Lazarus and he was crying out and saying that, can Lazarus be sent back and just say to my family, just tell them. There are people whose lives have been cut short and now they're in a place where they say, only if I knew I would have not allowed myself these things that were only gratifying me for a season and now for eternity I'm facing in a place in hell. Because heaven and hell is real. And so you must choose to deny yourself. The Spirit of the Lord is saying there's someone here who needs to choose to deny themselves of being right. You have been in conversations that have broken some significant relationships because you need to be right. And the Holy Spirit is saying that Many times you have found yourself in, an, in the middle of an argument and you have crossed that threshold where you realize I'm wrong. Come on. Where you realize I'm wrong, but you can't turn back. You are arguing with your wife, with your husband, sometimes parent to children. You've come and you are getting close and you can see, wow, I'm wrong. But because of pride, because of the need to be right, because if you give up the need to be right and the need to lose this argument, you feel that you will be, you'll be naked. You will lose certain things in that relationship. You will lose respect. Maybe your wife doesn't respect you and as a man you are arguing about something and now you've realized I'm wrong but you will keep on fighting your corner because if you say that my wife, I'm wrong, forgive me, then she will say you are always wrong. So you have decided to fight. That is a luggage that may cost you eternal life. He is saying to someone here, get rid of the need to always be right. Practice saying, I'm sorry. Practice saying, I really, I've got this one wrong completely. Father, practice saying to your young son, I'm so sorry. Son, I got this one wrong. I really got this wrong. Father, have the courage to call your child, even some of your adult children, and say to them that I, I did wrong. Because some of your children are growing up and they are carrying certain things of what you did. Maybe you are too heavy handed with your discipline. Maybe they saw certain things in your life and you are too proud to say I'm wrong. Call them and say, I was wrong. The need for me to remain right is not good, is not strong enough for me to lose heaven. Hallelujah. Maybe there is something you did in, 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 that, that is, is a huge betrayal in your marriage, adultery or something. Is your need to not open a can of worms, is your need to remain looking like you are right, greater than eternal life? I know for you to go to your wife to say that, my wife, I did something. I was unfaithful. I know it will break trust in your life. Yes, it will. It will cause her to be hurt or vice versa. But is your need to remain in that safe zone, is it stronger, is it more important than you entering the kingdom of heaven? 
when you are standing at that gate and your name is not in the book of life, will you remaining looking innocent be worth it? Will it be worth it when you are facing eternity in hell? When you are standing at the gate, if you are a believer, then you believe what God has said. He made hell not for you, but for the demons, for Satan and his demons. But because of our rebellion and because of some of these things that we want to hold on, short-termism. Yes, you may go through life enjoying the fruit of that thing, but how about eternity, my friend? Hey, how about eternity? Maybe you are a pastor, maybe you are, a, you, 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 are a, you are an evangelist, maybe you are a man of God, and you being exposed or exposing yourself, you fear that people will say that I am not who they said I am. Is that worth eternal life? Ah, not for me. Not for me. I say to myself, there is nothing that is going to, be, to stop me from going to be with my father for eternity. Hallelujah. Number two, number one, choose. You must choose to deny yourself. And when you have chosen to deny yourself, the Bible is saying now you walk in freedom. Psalm 119.45 says, I will walk in freedom for I have devoted myself to your commandments. You know when you are, when you have gotten rid of uh, all these baggage, you are able to walk in freedom. Hallelujah. You know, on this path, this path that is narrow, the Bible talks about the gate and it talks about the path. You are able to walk in freedom because you don't have things which are stopping you. It is for freedom that he has set us free. So stay free. Galatians 5.1 says, so Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. It is when we are free and some things want to come and they want to attach themselves to us. We look and in prayer, we say, I'm staying in freedom. Hallelujah. I'm walking in freedom. It is possible to walk the path that is narrow and to do so in freedom. It doesn't have to be a struggle. Once you have become free, you become like the, like the apostles. When they go and they are being persecuted, guess what they did? They didn't go and cry about it. They came back and they rejoiced. The Bible says they would rejoice in their persecution. They would almost go and share and brag that, wow. Do you know when persecution becomes a thing that you just talk about? It's when you are free. When people decide to not be your friend, when you are free from the need to please people, it is water off your back. It is nothing. Hallelujah. Choose to deny, walk in freedom, and stay free. What are you holding that may stop you from entering the narrow gate? I want to welcome you to stand and we pray. We pray as we go into this new season. We have gone past the halfway mark of the year. God has called us to a life of impact. That is the word we began with. is, is going to be the focus of the, of the conference. And God is saying that for you to impact people's lives, he is calling you to a life of freedom. First of all, just free yourself. Hallelujah. I want you to pray this morning that God, will you begin to shine a light on the baggage that is not obvious in my life? I'm talking about some things of what you believe, your culture, some wrong doctrine, some, some dream, some, your need for success. These are not things that are bad, but if these things preoccupy you, you don't want to be like that rich young ruler. Let me tell you something. God is not in the business of making people poor. If that rich young ruler had not created an attachment and a, 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 an idol in his wealth, Jesus would have not asked him to get rid of it. He would have not asked. Jesus was around rich people, you know. 
There are people who are wealthy who are around him and they did the work they needed to do. But he saw this man and he said, your problem has not been to keep the law. Your problem is that you have kept a God. It is not that you've not kept the law. It is you have kept a God. And he said to him that you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven with another God. I will be your only God. I must be your only God. Hallelujah. Why don't you join me and we pray? In the name of Jesus. Come on, speak to God and say, Lord, what is it in me? What is the baggage in me that is causing me to, to find myself walking on the wide path? What is it that is causing me to be here? And just because many of my Christian brothers and sisters are in this path, I seem to think that it's okay. I know there are some of us here, we are on this one and because we seem to be together with others who profess Christ, we have allowed the, 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 the lie of the enemy to say that we are okay. God is saying that come out from among them. Come out from among them. That's where you ought to be, not there. This is very comfortable. Yes, this is very lovely. This is where everybody is. Millions of people are walking this path. But he's saying that come out from among them, my son. Life is short and I want you to not lose eternal life because you could not get rid of the baggage that you are carrying. He says come out from among them. Hallelujah. Come out from among them. Hi everybody, we just want to welcome you to our different activities which happen here in Fountain Church. On Monday we have our men's fellowship which happen here at 6.30. On Tuesday we've got the intercession which also happen here at 6.30. Wednesday Bible study we meet online on Zoom. And on Friday we have the young people connected meeting at 6.30 and the women in power at 7. And inspire all the young people in this church. Uh, they meet every two weeks. So we can't wait to see you there. God bless you and you have a lovely day.